Hey everybody, it's Mr. Rosette. We're going to piggyback off of our last video talking about isoparms and painting in 3D and I'm going to give you a little demonstration on how to do that from a photo overlay from an animal. So to recap what our lesson is, we've learned how to do this. Just create generic three-dimensional organic shapes using a grid and having a little bit of understanding of perspective. We can plot light on this surface, draw it in 3D using the 1, 2, 3 read, and apply other basic lighting foundations to it, for example, bounce light and drop shadow. And the reason we're learning to do this is to understand form and volume when applying light to it. So you see artists, whenever we draw or paint something, we always try to think, what's the form doing and where's the light at? And that gives the illusion that this thing makes sense, that it works on the canvas. Especially when we're creating things that don't exist. We need to understand what the form is doing in order to know how the light will react to it. So to put it into practice, our lab is going to look like the following. We're going to create three generic isoparms. And the more complex, the better, unless you're still at a very basic level. Now these structures need to have the cut lines. Another word for those are form lines or cross contours. That's to show me your understanding of three-dimensional form and volume and foreshortening. You'll render these with a one, two, three read, bounce light, and a drop shadow in black and white. Moving on from there, you're going to select three photographs of different animals. I chose a baby turtle, a lobster, and a baby bunny rabbit. You'll render each of those after gridding them out, just like the isoparms up here on the top. The final step is to take your favorite one, and my favorite was the baby bunny rabbit, and using only the grid, I rendered it from two additional lighting strategies. Now we're only using the grid on this. We're not going to look at the photograph as any form of reference on what the light is doing. So just hop on the internet and find a photograph. Some of my students suggested we do a German Shepherd, so I searched for him. When you do a Google image search, make sure that you go to Tools, Size, Large. In order to demonstrate the skill outside of a basic range, avoid flat shots. For example, this profile shot, or shots where the animal or form is looking directly at you. Before you bring your photo into it, make sure that you're working in a canvas that's at 300 resolution. Here's our photograph layer right here, and because I don't want to draw on any of those, I lock them by pushing this button here. So I create a brand new layer, I'm going to call it Grid 1, and start drawing. The reason animals are so good for this exercise is because they have natural symmetry. So for example, we've got two forms here, they're symmetrical, and just by looking at the form we can just see what's happening. Here is this line of symmetry right on the form. So the first thing I like to do is go in and define my center lines as I draw. I'd recommend that you stay zoomed out at this stage. And you can do this piecemeal. For example, uh, if you're not the best at drawing lines, just make a line, rotate your canvas, get that comfortable angle, and go hit the line again. So I'm using the letter R on the keyboard to rotate the canvas so that I can have a comfortable angle when I'm making strokes with my stylus. I've also got my thumb on the space bar to move myself around. Don't be afraid to zoom in. Go find that nose. You can make markers to indicate symmetry. Switch to your eraser and touch up if you need to. So now I come to the nose and the nose kind of bulges upward. So I'm gonna, that's called a positive turn with the cross contour. So I'm gonna go up and over and we can see the little cleft on the nose and that indicates the symmetry. I'm just going to follow that down. Here's his cleft lip. Follow that. Now his little mouth turns under and it's going to disappear back in here somewhere where we can't see it. So we're going to have to look at this bottom lip and kind of eyeball where the center line is going to be on there. Just going to go back, clean up some edges. This is going to turn flat. And let's go find his horizontal uh, kind of equator on his nose. So I might start in his nose. And here's where his cute little schnoz turns under. And follow the curvature that you see on the form itself. As a student, your ultimate goal is to be able to do this in your head with any type of creation that you make. So whether it's a dog that you make up or a dog-like creature, then you would know by studying how dogs' noses work, how the forms operate, you would be able to paint this and know what parts curve under and what parts catch light. So these hard edges for the nostrils, I do draw those as well. And then once it curves over, just follow through. Let's get some grid lines across here. Try not to clutter your drawing up with too many of them, otherwise when you zoom out it's going to be pretty difficult to read. So wrapping around, this is going down and away from us. So our lines are going to go that way. Now here you're seeing these curves 
consistently happening at that angle, that is a flag for you to know where to put another cross contour, another piece of information that shows where the form is turning. So what's helpful is to look at some clues in the form itself. You see this guy's furry, and so the fur of a German Shepherd is pretty short, so it follows the contours of his skin naturally. For big shaggy animals, that doesn't quite work so well, especially in this area. I'm gonna have to have a hard time interpreting. You can see that his nose follows angles like this, and then curves down. He's got a nice little wrinkle right here, so that's gonna curve over. So that's a positive. And he sinks in, sinks in. And here we got another wrinkle. Up and over, up and over. So let's get into the eye. Let's break it down into basic shapes. So we've got this big mass right here, but if you notice, there's this little shelf right here that if you were a tiny little person, you could sit on. So let's consider that when we're drawing our lines. So I'm gonna go out and turn under. It's gonna to come towards us and start to turn away to the other direction. And then we've got the underside of the form proper right here. And then you got these little curvatures. Those are clues on where to put another cut line. and then define the edge of the form here, just so we don't have these lines floating out into space. Now we've got the eyeball, so find center. I'm gonna follow the angle of the pupil, and just like a globe, it's going to curve out and away from us like that. Here's the equator, and then it's gonna go down like so. Now let's resolve these little gaps over here. This is gonna come out and up, out and up, out and up, almost like a pinwheel if you look at it that way. And again, where we've got curvature, that's gonna tell us where to create a cut line. And then these lines continue over his cute schnoz. And so you just continue doing this with positive and negative contours until you've got the entire animal all gridded out. Ding, and there we go, it is now gridded out. So one thing to think about with the grid is, make sure that you have enough information on there that you could give it to another person and they would be able to see where the planes change and where the forms change as well. The reason for that is, is that the more information that you've got in your grid, the more information you will have to work off of when you paint there won't be any need for interpretation. For example, in this area right here, I think there could be a little bit more grid action. It seems a little void or vacant. Here is a little confusing as well. So is the inside of the ear. I might wanna go back and maybe take a couple more passes and add more lines to it. Also, if you ever go in and you need to make corrections to your lines or clean them up, your lines might look like that, you know? We, we want them to look like that. Commit to one stroke. The way you do that is you drop a stroke, and if it's not the stroke that you want, Command Z, drop it, drop it, drop it, drop it. A very fast and fluid process like this. Use the letter E for erase, grab your brush key, and then try it out. You might get it in one shot. So here would be a couple of examples of lighting these forms up using different lighting strategies. So this one on the left, I decided to light it from the top and slightly at an angle. And this one on the right, it's not finished yet, but you can see how it's underlit from the bottom left and in front. Think, where's the one, two, three read? What planes are directly facing the light? What planes are indirectly facing the light? And what planes are facing away from the light? So with the grid, as always, start with a silhouette mid-tone and have that silhouette go right up to the edge of your lines. The reason you make that silhouette is for making a selection. When you make a selection, it allows you to paint inside of that area. Next I do a light pass, so I think where's my light coming from, and then in a new layer I just add light directly on where those forms would read. And this is called pushing and pulling. Light reacts to a surface if it's tall enough to catch the light. Things that catch light are typically raised up towards the light, so that's called pulling. And then using core in a new layer, I go in and I push. So things that are dark are turned away from the light. Pushing. 
So if I turn on and off the midtone, the midtone that I painted is working with these values that I've got. I did a brief cleanup pass here. So if I zoom into the nose, had some pretty janky edges in this region right here I had some soft edges I wanted a hard edge between the socket and the eyeball itself so I just defined that using my brush then I put a drop shadow underneath and that helps the figure pop here's a fun thing you can do with your presentation I wasn't very happy with the gray midtone and the gray of my isoparm it didn't really feel like the contrast was bold enough so one thing I did as a presentation element is add a gradient behind it and that gradient the darkest parts of the gradient are right up where the lightest parts of the form are, and it starts to fade into light where the darkest parts of the form are, okay? So I wouldn't want to put a light part of the gradient up here fading to dark. I would want it dark near the light, put those opposites next to each other, and that really helps it pop. No need for big flashy borders or anything like that. You can keep it simple. Use a gradient. If you want to do rules and lines, you could. As a matter of fact, here's my gradient layer. We could just use our marquee tool draw a little box and then hit delete and see that makes a nice little rule on the top and so for your lab if this dog happened to be your favorite animal form that you made you would just again reproduce that two more times so here is your first isoparm of that dog form here would be the second one if it were complete finished to a different light source and then you would do it again a third time to a totally different light source than the other two. You know, for example, like backlit, uh, lit from the right. So this has been a demonstration on how to build the grid and also just a general workflow on how to go about making the isoparms of your animal forms. I hope you guys found this helpful. I look forward to seeing you in class. Take care.